I'm Paul Krikorian, chair of the newly formed Ad Hoc Committee on Film and Television Production. Uh, I'm joined uh, my, by my colleague, uh, Mitch O'Farrell, Council Member Mitch O'Farrell, who also chairs uh, our Arts Committee here on the Council, and will be joined shortly by Council Member Curran Price, uh, the chair of our Economic Development and Jobs Committee. So um, we are all very, very delighted and uh, inspired to see such a large, tr large turnout of people who are uh, interested in this issue, and I want to thank you all for coming down this evening to Los Angeles City Hall. Um, we all, I, the people who are here already know the extraordinary value of uh, the film and television industry uh, to Los Angeles and to California. Uh, but to try to put it in terms of numbers a little bit, um, there are 250,000 people who are employed in film and television production uh, directly in California, and probably almost three times that many who depend for their employment on that industry with indirect jobs. In Los Angeles alone, over $1.3 billion uh, in sales and income tax was generated by the wages of film and television employees who live here in the city of Los Angeles. We have 6,400 businesses uh, that in California that are dependent upon the film and television industry. That's three times more film and TV businesses here than we have Starbucks coffees in California. So that should give you kind of a visual of the impact of, of this industry. This is the third largest industry in the county of Los Angeles after only international trade and tourism. And certainly tourism is itself very much dependent upon the fact that this industry makes its home and traditionally has made its home in Los Angeles. But that, I think, is a fact that is almost as important to me as the, the pure numbers of it and the pure economic impact. This industry is the heritage of this city. This is the industry more than any other that has defined who we are as a city. Uh, this is the industry that more than any other has allowed us to grow up from being a tiny little uh, village to becoming the second largest metropolis in the United States. It's this industry that has guided this city's growth and defined us and identified us in the minds of people throughout the world. So um, that's why it's so critically important that we come together as a committee, and I'm so pleased that President Wesson has, uh, has seen fit to create this ad hoc committee, and I want to welcome my, my colleagues to, to the work that we have here today. We join with our mayor in calling for this city to act with great urgency to protect the industry that calls its uh, home Los Angeles and the industry that Los Angeles depends upon to such a, a great degree for its economic vitality and also for uh, our heart and soul. But unfortunately, for the last decade and a half or so, gradually this industry has been chipped away by runaway production uh, to other states, other countries, beginning with Canada and then uh, soon states throughout the United States. Over 40 other states in the United States have lucrative tax incentives that are designed specifically to target our jobs and take our jobs away. And the reason that those states are enacting those tax incentives is because they know that it makes good economic sense to do that. The investment that they make in those incentives pays dividends for their economy in, in jobs and in, in uh, tax revenues. And unfortunately, throughout that time, as all that was happening, as all of you who are sitting here today saw that happening and saw these jobs slipping away and going elsewhere, regrettably, uh, California was pretty much asleep at the switch and just took for granted that Hollywood would always be here because, heck, there's a big Hollywood sign up there on the mountain, so it must always have to stay here. We know that that wasn't the case. Um, and time and again, California failed to do anything to try to remain competitive with the rest of the country. In 2009, after many failed efforts to try to compete with the rest of the, 
the country. Uh, the California State Legislature finally acted and, and initiated the California Film and Television Production Tax Incentive. Uh, I was proud to be the author of the California Film and Television Production Tax Incentive when I was a member of the State Assembly, when we had the first successful incentive enacted and signed by the governor. And uh, it was my great privilege to be able to work with many of you to get that job done. As a result of that tax incentive, uh, there's been over 40,000 direct film jobs that have been saved and over 100,000 jobs of other Californians uh, who are dependent upon this industry as well. But even with all of that, employment is still down in the film industry here in Los Angeles, down by 12% uh, in the last decade. On-location movie production is down 60% in Los Angeles since it's high. One hour TV network television production was, we had an 89% market share in 2005 here in Los Angeles. That's down to 37% as of 2012. And as we see this industry slipping away, who is that impacting? It's not impacting the Hollywood A-listers. It's not impacting the studios. It's not impacting the, um, famous actors or the famous directors or producers. The people that it impacts are the people who have good middle class jobs raising their families here in Los Angeles, who don't get the chance to travel, who work only when production stays here. Or if they do get fortunate enough to be on a production and have to travel, they get taken away from their family for sometimes months at a time just to be able to keep an income going. And that has just been devastating to this industry uh, here in, in Los Angeles. The people who get hurt by runaway production are not the people that are, the television audience is going to be watching at the Academy Awards in a few days. The people who get hurt by runaway production don't show up to work in limousines. They drive to work in a pickup truck. They don't carry briefcases to work. They strap on tool belts. And those are the people that we're determined to help. Those are the people that we're determined to keep uh, working here in Los Angeles by keeping production here. Uh, so with that, I want to thank you all again very, very much for being here. And I'd like to offer an opportunity to my colleagues to offer a few initial comments. Mr. O'Farrell. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, exquisitely put. I uh, am so very pleased to be appointed to this committee. Uh, I look out into the gallery and I see several Council District 13 residents and I welcome all of you, all of my friends, uh, both in the district and across the city of Los Angeles and the county of Los Angeles uh, for this very important regional issue. Um, it was the lure of Hollywood and the entertainment industry that brought me to Hollywood 32 years ago. Um, and it is the lure of Hollywood and Los Angeles that continues bringing migrants and immigrants to Los Angeles to this day. Um, we need to do all that we can to not just protect and save our signature industry, but make it stronger than ever before. And I stand with my colleagues on this panel, and I stand with you to do everything we possibly can uh, to make sure that that happens. Every decision, every thought that I have uh, keeps in mind the costumers, the caterers, the makeup artists, the drivers, the grips, the, the, the primary and secondary, the direct and indirect uh, jobs and professionals that are dependent upon this industry. You report to work before dawn every day and leave after dark. It's for you that we need to return this industry to its rightful birthplace here in Los Angeles. We owe it to you to do everything we can to help keep your families together so that you can work in Los Angeles and report at home every night to your family, to your children, to your animals. Uh, that's what this industry is all about, and, and us on this panel, we really get that. Um, I just want to say the very first movie studio was in the 13th District. I'm going to just brag a little bit, Mr. Chair, sure, if you don't please, mind. Please, please. Uh, in Edendale, the Edendale. Uh, it's now a public storage, but it was in Echo Park. Uh, an open-air soundstage built by Maverick film producer Max Sinnott. He built a second studio in Silver Lake in the 13th District, which has been brought back to life as the Max Sinnott stages. Uh, it was built for his, his girlfriend, Mabel Norman, a silent screen star. We have the history to fall back on, but we want to make sure that we don't become a museum of what was in the past. 
there is a way that we can keep the history very much alive, keep studio production very much alive uh, well into the future. It's very critical that network television productions be eligible and be given the security of knowing that it will carry for the run of the production for an incentive, oftentimes five plus years. A one hour episodic television show can employ 200 people and uh, where they spend one to two million dollars per episode in the local economy. A 21 episode season can generate 20 to 40 million dollars in spending to the local economy and employment sector. And as Chair Krikorian mentioned, our share is down from 89 percent less than a decade ago to 30 some odd percent now. These 200 employed persons now contribute to the economy at the most local level, spending money in restaurants, supermarkets, farmers markets, etc., cetera, um, beefing up our tax base so we in turn can trim your trees, resurface the streets, deliver those basic neighborhood services that we all need. This is indeed a signature industry and one that we depend on uh, for the quality of life in our neighborhoods. Locally, we can make it, uh, it easier for film, filming as well. I'm terribly interest, interested in exploring that. In October of last year, the City Council passed a motion to waive fees for TV pilots shooting in LA. And I want to just really thank my colleagues Paul Krikorian and Corinne Price for their leadership at the state level uh, to help lead to that local uh, result. Um, LA captured just 52% of all the pilots this past season, down from 60% 60 60 just a couple of years ago. Uh, our office is working closely with Film LA, and I'm so delighted we're about to hear from Paul Audley later um, on, and the Teamsters, uh, the Motion Picture Association of America, and local studios to improve how we can work with something as basic as signpostings through the Department of Transportation to make it easier for location filming across the city of Los Angeles to streamline the process. We want to focus on the micro and macro uh, levels to keep production here. More local incentives can and will be developed and you will help point us the way to make that happen so we can synthesize these ideas and save this industry and make it stronger than ever before. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm delighted to be here. Thank you very much, Mr. O'Farrell. Mr. Price. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, for your leadership on this, uh, this important issue. Um, and it's good to see uh, Hollywood and our friends out here today. <clears throat> we know how important uh, this industry is, not just uh, to our city, but really to our state and to our country. Hollywood uh, is a brand, and we should really be taking advantage of it. Uh, I certainly supported these issues when I was in the legislature, uh, in the Senate, uh, I certainly uh, I represented portions of Hollywood, as a matter of fact, representing Sony, Fox, and, and Paramount Studios, uh, and uh, always uh, was mindful of the unique role that the movie industry plays in maintaining um, and, and enhancing our economy. Um, in the Senate, I chaired the Joint Committee on the Arts, and uh, we held a number of hearings, in fact, on runaway productions and, and the negative impact. Uh, to the uh, industry here in Los Angeles. And so um, I just want to uh, reaffirm my commitment to um, continue uh, working with you uh, and your issues. And I'm, I'm proud to say that, uh, you know, the Hollywood pro the production activity isn't just on the west side uh, That's right. or in the uh, valley, uh, Mr. Chairman. In fact, we've got a studio uh, here in, in the 9th District, Central City Stages, some of you may be familiar with. Uh, but more importantly, uh, the, j the jobs that, uh, that are impacted, uh, you know, the restaurants, uh, the cleaners, uh, the limo drivers, the event planners, uh, the florists, all the services that go into making a production successful, those are the ones frequently that are, that are overlooked. And so I'm very pleased to stand with my colleagues uh, to um, support uh, efforts to maintain the incentives that we fought so hard for, and we need to expand them. You know, uh, New York uh, uh, has incentives uh, reaching, I think, almost $500 million a year. And for us to, to kind of try to divvy up 100, uh, 100 million, 500 million a year, for us to have to divvy up 100 million is really, uh, really an effort. And so I'm looking forward to doing whatever we can do to help support AB 1839, making sure that the resources are there, uh, not just for the, the efforts above the line, but below the line, and making certain that the resources uh, assist you in providing the kinds of services, providing the kind of products that made 
Hollywood important, make Hollywood famous, and it still are important for us to uh, maintain our economy, uh, providing good local jobs, uh, and making certain that we can benefit from the efforts in the past. So, Mr. Chairman, I'm happy to be here, and I look forward to the testimony today. Thank you very much, Mr. Price. Um, so, what we have planned initially is probably th three initial meetings of this uh, of this committee. Today's meeting will be primarily to define the problem, uh, sort of define it in statistical terms, but also in human terms, and talk about what really uh, the challenges are that this city is facing as a result of runaway production. Um, and then the next meeting that we have will deal with the state tax incentive and um, efforts that are now underway in Sacramento to extend and expand eligibility for that incentive. And then finally, we'll, we'll conclude our initial work at least with a meeting that will be specific to policy objectives uh, in Los Angeles that can make this city a more attractive place for production as well. Some of the things that Mr. O'Farrell was talking about, for example, and other, other policy recommendations that the industry may have and that others may have as to how we can facilitate filming and, and eliminate some of the barriers to filming that we have here in the city. Uh, if you have not already filled out a speaker card and you would like to be heard today, please go ahead and fill one of these out and bring it forward. Uh, we're going to have a few speakers that will be um, sort of examples, uh, I guess, if you will, of the issue from labor and also from our business community. Uh, and then we'll have individual speakers come up at the conclusion of, of those speakers. But to start off, what I'd like to do is ask Paul Audley of Film LA to come forward and give us an overview of some of the impacts that runaway production has had uh, on our industry in recent years. And then we'll, when Mr. Audley concludes, we'll hear some of the more personal impacts of, of that uh, of that phenomenon as well. Mr. Audley, welcome. Thank you, Council Member Krikorian and members of the panel. Uh, to start with, I do want to express as your film office the gratitude that we have uh, in being able to point back to the city and the city council for the support it gives to us in the industry in trying to keep this uh, industry alive and vital here in Los Angeles. Uh, and it's been great support and good things have happened. Uh, nonetheless, the competition from the rest of the world and states in, in this country have devastated this industry uh, to the point that uh, as we talk about some of these numbers, my gravest concern now is we've been talking for years about cast and crew and what's happened to them and their transitions, and that remains a critical problem, including them moving permanently. Uh, but for the last few years, we've seen an accelerated rate of losing the vendor base uh, underneath that, which is the key support, which still makes it cheaper to film in California absent those tax credits. And the grave concern that, that I raise at this point is if the state isn't uh, willing to become more competitive, that we stop being the center, the easiest, the cheapest place to film. And I don't believe we have a lot of time left before that happens. But some of the good news about what can happen with a return and what goes on is uh, numbers uh, like the fact that there's 1.3 billion in taxes from film industry wages alone could hire 36,000 teachers in California. Uh, and so this industry su can support so much more than just when you think about the cultural aspects of it. Uh, but we recently released a report, and I'm going to refer uh, folks here to two different places for a lot of great information. On the city's film office website at filmla.com are a number of uh, film studies done by independent resources, and also the one we just did, a 10-year retrospective on filming in Los Angeles and what's happened to it. Um, and then at Filmworks CA, uh, com, which is the Alliance's website. Those of us uh, in the industry and the film liaisons across the state and vendors and others uh, as an information resource center that people can go to for information. Uh, you've heard some of the numbers already about the changes we've seen in California and what's happened uh, to it as a result. Uh, and the fact that a 22-episode TV series c sustains 840 jobs and $8.4 million in state and local tax revenue uh, is really important when you recognize that uh, we went from 79% of new network television. In 2012, we went to 8%. Uh, 
Uh, and when you see that kind of number, 840 jobs, 8.4 million in tax revenue, going from having 79% of that share to 8%, you recognize the dramatic financial and employment impact that the loss of this industry has to these other states and countries that are anxious to take this industry from us. Here in Los Angeles specifically, um, we know that a lot has happened over time. And in the features category, for example, uh, we peaked at around 1996 at almost 14,000 days of production in Los Angeles at the time uh, when we began to lose to uh, this incentive race started in Canada. Uh, our steep decline is almost exclusively due to that fact that we're now competing with tax credits in 40 states and 30 countries uh, whose sole job is to take business from California. Uh, it's made a significant change in the economic value of the feature projects made here as well. In 1997, almost all the major studio features were done here in California, many of them in L.A., and by 2013, most of those projects were made elsewhere. Just two of the year's live-action movies with budget, budgets over $100 million were filmed in L.A. at all, and only one was filmed entirely in California. Today, most local feature production done in this region is small independent projects that are wonderful to have. They create new filmmakers and new careers, uh, but they have very small employment and spend numbers. 2009 marked the worst year for local feature production in Los Angeles, bottoming out going from 14,000 to just under 5,000 production days. Uh, we've seen an increase thanks to the efforts in the state and the city, but in particular with the eventual enactment of a tax credit here, which stopped the rapid bleeding uh, and enabled us to stabilize to a degree. Uh, and as time goes on, uh, we've seen the impact of, of a, a lack of awareness in Sacramento, at least, that the television industry could also leave. And so what we're seeing now in the television category has been, instead of it being a growth industry for us, as it was for many, many years, uh, providing a lot of work for talented uh, crew and, and cast members uh, and for the vendors and small businesses of the region, uh, it is now displaced as well. So the growth uh, in local television followed an increase in new cable channels and service providers, but now uh, we see that also eroding as more and more states, including my home state of Connecticut, which decided television is so valuable, they suspended film uh, tax credits and are only going to capture series television, which creates long-term employment for large numbers of people and large spend. Uh, television production declined after 2007 to a 10-year low in 2009. Um, and then since then, what we've seen is uh, the television, film, and tax credit helping but not being able to stem the tide as it's a very limited program. Within television, the drama subcategory is the one that we've seen really dramatic change, and it is, of course, one of the most valuable forms of uh, filmmaking for our region, providing hundreds of thousands of opportunities for employment and billions of dollars in revenues. So what we've seen there is uh, a drop that could be pointed at what once was the pillar of our film industry here. Uh, it represents about 2% or 2 out of every 10 days locked for, tele uh, for television in L.A. is drama. And that's more than sitcoms, but now reality TV has bypassed our dramatic television production. We're also seeing a great deal more of direct-to-web, which again, a very, very low economic value, very low employment number. So while our permit numbers may be increasing, what we're seeing is the economic value of what we're permitting for in Los Angeles continues to decrease more and more as time goes by. The other critical area that we're seeing a loss in has been pilots, uh, and the city has taken some action to try and make it more attractive by waiving many of the fees associated with filming pilots. Uh, for the past nine years, we have been producing an international report on where pilots have been filmed. Um, they look at local TV production in Los Angeles and competing jurisdictions, and it is a very comprehensive um, look at this part of the film industry, television industry. Um, more TV pilot projects were made in Los Angeles this year than in 2012, but a smaller share of the pie of TV pilots that were made internationally. Um, Unfortunately, it's growing more outside than in, and so what we saw was our share of TV pilot production declining to just 52%, the second lowest yield on record for TV pilots uh, for this region. Just six years earlier, we were closer to 82% of all television pilots made. Uh, the reality for the folks who are competing with us is that that is an entree to keeping a film 
uh, and television project there, and so they've aggressively courted that part of the industry as well. What the, the basic message is, is that while your film office is producing permits, it's not producing the jobs we'd like to produce along with them. Uh, absent more work uh, from Sacramento and expanded credit, we see a continued decline in the number of jobs available. We see a rapid decline in the available source of vendors and suppliers to this industry, which will weaken Los Angeles in the international marketplace. And we see a situation now where we've waited long enough that we know we're going to have more permanent competitors, but we haven't waited so long that rapid action and dramatic action couldn't wipe out most of those competition that we have out there, returning much of the work back to the state of California. On a personal note, uh, I'm renting a house from a film accountant who hasn't been able to live in California for 18 months, and she just got another job that put her out of state for another 18 months, gave up, and I am now renting her home. Uh, because she can't live in the state where she lives. And one of the critical points um, that needs to be made in this is there's a misconception by many people that California residents working elsewhere are still providing uh, tax payments to the state of California and local government, and they do not. They pay where they work, uh, and that's part of the crisis we face is that while they want to be here and many of their families are here and they want to be part of this community, they're paying their tax share into other places. And that's just as painful for many of these people as the fact that they're not home. <coughs> uh, I'd be happy to enter entertain any questions you have on the information we have, but I think you all know those numbers. You've cited them yourselves as well. Uh, but I hope that sets the groundwork for where we're moving. Thank you very much, Mr. Utley. And it's certainly sobering uh, to hear all those uh, statistics in one place. And I especially appreciate that you brought into the discussion the issue of the vendor base. Um, which is so critically important because I think many uh, television shows in particular who have sought incentives, chased incentives elsewhere, many have been disappointed with the outcome because, yes, they saved a little with the incentive, but they didn't have the benefit of the incredible convenience of the vendor base that we have here in Los Angeles. They didn't have the benefit of the best crews, the best talent anywhere in the world that we have here in Los Angeles. That gives us a little bit of a competitive advantage that can offset some of the cost differential. But when we lose that, we will have lost that competitive advantage as well. And if, if these vendors are not able to continue to keep their doors open because of the loss in, uh, in revenues that they're bringing in, that is going to continue to eat away with the, the thing that gives us the, the, the last remaining thing other than weather that gives us a good... Uh, competitive advantage with the rest of the world. So it's a very important part of the discussion as well. Members, questions for Mr. Adler? Just, Mr. just real quick, and if you don't mind, thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I, we know that the industry wants desperately to stay in Los Angeles, and that's clear. And I'm encouraged by some development that's happening in, in, in the district and the city and discouraged by others. For example, uh, Siren Studios in Hollywood built a new soundstage. That's phenomenal. It's awesome. But we also know that the major studios across the city, uh, there's a lot of master planning going on, and they're, they're planning on growth that doesn't necessarily involve filming on their lots any longer, or at least in a more limited way. Uh, so uh, I think you just underscored the fact that the infrastructure is here, the talent's here, the people, the industry desperately wants to stay here. So it becomes a matter of what are we waiting for and uh, it's unclear how successful we'll be at, as of this moment in terms of getting the tax incentives that we desperately need at the state level, considering we're now competing with 40 other states and 30 other countries. We, we absolutely must uh, accept nothing less, and we have to make the case uh, that this is, is not about uh, making sure that Tom Cruise has a bigger paycheck, uh, but it's, it's all of the other uh, countless thousands of people uh, so uh, I'm, I'm interested in what we can do locally right now as well. And that's just something that I want to keep uh, sort of sniffing up that tree, uh, and I look forward to exploring that with this committee and, and with Film LA and our partners out there. Thank you. Perfect. Thanks. Thank you. Mr. Price, questions? Well, this was, thank you for your comments. You've done a great job in helping to uh, <clears throat> create the environment. You know, but you, you need some ammunition. And I think uh, providing uh, the industry with the kinds of resources, the kind of incentives, the kind of help uh, 
uh, that uh, will actually save jobs and create the jobs is, is what we're after. And so I, I join my colleagues. We want to know what we can do now uh, as well. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Adley. Appreciate your uh, testimony. I'd like to now invite up um, some representatives of the men and women who work in the film and television industry. Uh, and I'd like to invite them to come up to the front table to, to talk about the impacts that a Runaway Production has had on their members. So um, I'd like to call up now Ed Duffy, uh, the business agent for Teamsters Local 399, Regina Render, the assistant executive director of the Directors Guild of America, Ileana Morden Kitchhaven, the executive director of SAG AFTRA, um, Ed Brown of IATSE Local 44, the business agent for IA44, Dooner of IATSE Local 871, and Ed Gutentag uh, of IA Local 600. So if you could all come on up. We got one. We got one coming here, Ed. Okay. All right. Welcome, everyone. And I know that uh, all of you have been very actively engaged in uh, fighting against the tide uh, for, for many, many years and continue to be so uh, now in, in Sacramento and here. So I'm delighted to have you all here. And I'd like to ask each of you to just give a, a few minutes overview um, about impacts on your membership or any other thoughts that you may have. And then I'm sure the members might have some questions that we'll toss out to, to the group. So, uh, Ed, you want to, who, who, who wants to start? I can start. I will. Uh, thank you very much, Councilman. Um, uh, my name is Ed Duffy. I'm a vice president of Teamsters Local 399. We represent drivers, location managers, casting directors, tour drivers, and a number of other groups. Um, you know, I, I've uh, been in this fight for quite a while now uh, because we, we noticed right away, and even in the late uh, 19, in 1998 or so, that, that we were starting to slip in, um, in, our, in our production here, that things were being drawn out of the state and out of the country. And it had just grown and grown, and it's become a, a completely devastating at this point. I, I recognize, or we recognize, that the... The, um, it isn't perceived maybe from the outside about how, how much production is leaving because um, we do see productions around town. We see people working, but it's not even nearly scratching the surface of the amount of production that we should have or still keep. Um, I am, uh, from a driver standpoint, what we always were able to do is being the unusual group that could follow their equipment out of town, that we drove the equipment to the location. Those drivers would always be working. That equipment now is being housed in all these different states. They no longer have to take our drivers to those places, and they don't because that equipment is already sitting there. All the facilities are there. The, um, the location managers that, that I was prior to this, um, they have gone to many states across the country and taught all the people that are taking their jobs how to do their job. And the ones that aren't are actually having to go and move there and actually take up residence in those places. Um, there are, or they're leaving their families for 10 months a year. Um, the, the, um, the, it's, it's been a very devastating thing, and I know there's a lot of statistics, so I don't have to go through them again, but you know, a lot of these members are like my family and most of them are very connected to me. And to hear them call me on a Friday and not be able to come home and see their kids because they're out of town, and their kids calling them, it's been horrible. I mean, they are, it's, it's if for weeks and weeks at a time, they don't see their kids grow up. And it's, it's really been bad. Um, just, and, and lastly, I, I, you know, I grew up in this, in this city. I, my grandfather was a writer, my uncle was a producer, my mother and father were both film editors. I, I was location manager for 28 years here. And it, it's just, it's really horrible to see this business just go away like it has. And we have to do something to be competitive. We have to keep fighting. We've obviously taken one step, but we have to do more. And that's basically it. 
Thank you. Ms. Render. Okay. Um, Regina Render, Assistant Executive Director, Directors Guild of America. Um, thank you for holding this hearing. The DGA represents about 15,000 industry workers, 8,500 8, live in California. And we represent directors, assistant directors, and unit <coughs> production managers. In California, 72% of the 8,500 members are directors, and 28% are below the line assistant directors and UPMs. Our members moved to California when this industry was thriving. Their families are entrenched, and their kids go to local schools. Now, because of runaway production, our directors have to leave their homes for months at a time, wreaking havoc on their families. So they are affected by the runaway production. Our below-the-line members have trained workforces outside of this state to do their jobs and are not needed for productions now. Um, they're unemployed. All of our members depend on work in order to get their health benefits. So they're without health benefits also. Our membership is devastated by the lack of work. Those that can have moved and the others that can't are on unemployment. Please do what you can to make sure that these incentives are passed. Thank you. Thank you very much. Hi. Uh, thank you so much for holding uh, this hearing, Councilman. Uh, this is a very important issue. My name is Leon Morden Kitchhaven, and I represent the Los Angeles local of Screen Actors Guild American Federation of Television and Radio Artists, also known as SAG-AFTRA. We have actors, stunts, singers, dancers, puppeteers, broadcasters, recording artists, as well as even some pilots that do some stunts. We have 165,000 members nationally. Out of that, 80,000 of them are in California, and about 70,000 are in the Los Angeles local area, which is basically Santa Barbara to Orange County. We've seen decreased work for our members, and I, and I just want to point out where you said that this is not about the people that you see necessarily at the award shows. I will tell you to a person, when I talk to the performers who are fortunate enough, or the stunt people who are fortunate enough to get work in other uh, cities and other countries, they would much rather stay in their own beds. So it is tearing families apart. It's also causing them certain costs out of pocket. Now, granted, I'm not talking about the ones that that it may be at the top that aren't quite as affected, and I don't certainly don't want to take away from people's unemployment, but it does ha give them certain costs that, that are unanticipated, and it does take away from their spending here in the state as well as spending on their family. But I also represent a lot of the day players and the background people who are in a lot of the shows which are are not filming here. For example, a one-hour drama that takes place in a police station downtown, it can employ hundreds of background performers, day players who represent judges, policemen, witnesses, victims, and a lot of times they hire them week after week, so we have people that have lost employment weeks or months at a time who are unable to make their health benefits, it's taking a drain on other issues, and they're also draining state on unemployment, uh, and they're running out of benefits, so they're unable to stay in their home. We're getting a lot of requests. Uh, our foundations are being taxed. We're sending them to other places to try to find uh, housing, food, and just the ability just to, to make it. Uh, we really appreciate the fact that you're working on uh, this important issue to attract and retrain. We are a national union, so I want to say that we're very grateful to the other states for providing unemployment to our other members, but the ones here in our largest local is really um, devastating. And on a personal note, like Ed, I grew up in Los Angeles. I went to UCLA Northern Campus, which was the artsy part of the school, if you're familiar with it. And I actually had a, my first job was at Universal Studios as a tour guide. And I remember the, that lot being so full of production and just walking around town and seeing it. And it's just, it's something which is very, very near and dear to me personally. So personally, I want to thank you as well. Thank you very much. Thanks for being here. Ed Brown? Good evening. Good evening. My name is Ed Brown. I'm the business agent of IATSC Local 44. Um, and I represent the largest below-the-line union in Hollywood, roughly 6,000 members. However, 
Um, I'd like to also speak on behalf of all the IATSC, roughly 40,000 working men and women in the industry. Uh, represented here today or this evening are local 706, 80, 44, 871, 800, 728, and 600. And if there's somebody that came in that I missed, I apologize to you. Um, I do want to focus a little bit on the broad effects, uh, not just my local, which I'll get to in a second, but the broad effects of the entire um, IATSC on the West Coast. Um, from 2004 to 2008, you know, you always have people that migrate, that leave a city, they want to go somewhere else. 2004 to 2008, 1,200 IATSC members, approximately, left the city of Los Angeles, the state of California, and migrated to other states. From 2009 to 2013, that number rose to approximately 1,600 industry workers of the IATSC that left Los Angeles, left California to other states. That represents a 25% spike in migration. Um, as, as incentives have become more aggressive, so has been the exodus of our workforce out of Los Angeles. I can barely speak after listening to the facts that Paul said from Film LA. That to, to hear that uh, as a 35-year participant in this industry, and I do remember Universal Studios when I started, I'm going to date myself, in 1977 on Rockford Files, that there was 28 television productions on the lot at Universal Studios. It was wall-to-wall -wall production. You can drive around there, and it's a theme park. My kids want to go there to see Despicable Me, the ride, not the movie. So the, the formula has changed. Uh, for my local alone, we, we talk about different kinds of things, lost jobs and so on, but let's talk about lost benefits, lost health and pension benefits. From my local alone, 5,800, 6,000 people, from 2010 to 2012, we had a drop in our re reportable pension and health contributions by the employers of 920,000 hours, almost a million lost hours. Now, where did those hours go to? They went outside of the city, outside of the state. That work is still being done. It's just not being done by Los Angeles residents. That's lost pension, lost health care to every single one of them. Um, mentioned earlier that only one major motion picture was shot entirely here in California. What does that represent? That represents 300 jobs, post-production 500 jobs. We lost network television, two to 300 jobs for every single one of them. We're busy. The town is busy right now. The business model has changed. What are we doing here now? We're doing lower end, direct to cable, uh, long form television. What, the, what is that? That is, a pro that is a production that employs a smaller number of people at a lower wage. So they may be working, but their yearly annual income has been compressed anywhere from 15 to 40 percent. So if you're a homeowner living in, in L.A. City, L.A. County, and you set up your life for a particular annual income, and now your, your income drops 40 percent, what do you do? You have to compress. You have to downsize. You can't spend as much money. You can't go to the mall. You can't buy that extra, you know, bag of groceries. Um, when mentioned vendors, I'm going to mention one real quick before I turn it over to my brothers here. Southland Lumber opened up its doors in 1946. Southland Lumber was the premier supplier of motion picture industry building supplies. They shut their doors on Valentine's Day. They could no longer service the industry or anybody else since 1946, and many more will follow. I want to thank you very much for having us out here tonight and looking into this primary issue. There is no other issue bigger than this. Thank you. Thank you very much. Dooner? Good evening, and Good. thank you again for the invitation. And thank you for attending our event over the weekend where we launched our effort, our industry-wide union effort, to promote film incentives in California. Uh, just to correct the record, I am the former president of IATSC Local 871. I am currently the organizer for IA Local 800, that's the Art Directors Guild. We represent art directors, scenic title and graphic artists, set designers, illustrators, storyboard artists, and previs artists. Um, you know, I could reiterate what you've heard over and over about how much our members, and not just our members, but 
all the workers in this industry are really hurting, whether they're being forced to travel out of town to take work or they're suffering here from the lack of work. But it's a story that's told over and over and over. For me, it's a little more personal. Prior to taking my current positions, I was one of the people who had to leave. I spent the better part of two years first doing a pirate movie in Iowa, figure that one out, <laughs> but I did, and hit the road, went to Iowa, and there was no weekly trip to the florist next door. Magic florist lost my business. There was no trip around the corner to Garbanzo Hardware. You know, a family-run business that I support when I'm in town, but I wasn't in town. There was no trip to any of the local restaurants, whether it be over in your district at the Edendale or over at Columbo's in Eagle Rock, family-owned businesses that when I'm in town, they're getting my money. They're not big corporations. They're small, family-owned, Los Angeles-based companies that aren't really even connected to the industry. But the loss of the industry is hurting them too. Because when the film workers in this, in this city and in this area aren't earning money, and aren't earning money here where their families are, they're not spending it here. The, the year after I went to Iowa, I ended up in Michigan, and New Mexico, and New York. Anywhere but here seemed to be the motto of the day. And it wasn't so much being away that hurt, it was knowing that my being away meant that those businesses were suffering. I'm not their number one customer, but I'm a regular customer and I'm a customer who's loyal to the family-owned businesses where I live. When I moved to California nearly 20 years ago, it wasn't so that I could make movies in Michigan. It wasn't so I could make movies in New, in New Mexico. It was so I could work in this industry, in the city where it grew up, in Los Angeles. And anything that you guys can do to help us, and anything we can do to help you make that a reality again, we're going to do it. Thank you. And that's such an important point that too often gets left out of this discussion because everybody talks about the direct spends and, you know, the, the local purchases and so on that a production makes. But sometimes we forget about the purchases that the individuals who have income are making that have nothing whatever to do with uh, the industry. They're just the same sorts of purchase that, purchases that all of us make. Uh, but those purchases aren't being made uh, if people aren't working. And, um, you know, we get very excited here in Los Angeles about the idea of attracting sports uh, to the city because of its economic benefit. And we've bent over backwards for years to try to draw an NFL team here and so on because of all the economic impact that supposedly has. But one $100 million film production produces more economic activity than three full seasons of the Lakers being here. So... You know, I think that kind of helps us to put into context the ripple effect that this industry has that we ought to be paying a lot more attention to. So thank you for raising that. And I uh, want to turn now to my friend Ed Gutentag, who's not only um, a great cinematographer, but also one of the real grassroots advocates uh, in this industry who's been fighting through shoot movies in california.com and every other way he can make his voice heard to try to save production locally so uh, ed can you tell us a little bit about your experience sure thank thank you and nice meeting you council member o'farrell and price and it um i'm ed gutentag i'm a cinematographer and um i grew up in california in my mind, my parents called it New Jersey. <laughs> and um, I was always out here in my head, and I moved out here in 1988. And um, I worked all the time as a camera assistant. My, my dream was to become a cinematographer and shoot big films. Um, I've worked on big films, I haven't shot a big film yet. But um, this effort, uh, for me, started on accident. I decided one day, right before I met you, that I was going to move to New Mexico because it was a close drive. It was close enough. And I was driving my daughter to school. I live in Topanga Canyon. I was going down the PCH. It was another beautiful day, and the dolphins were jumping. And I said, I'm not moving. You know, I had already pulled her out of public school because it didn't work, and I was 
knew I couldn't do anything about the traffic here, so I decided I was going to try and do something. And I, I met I met Councilmember Krikorian, and um, I realized that I had a voice, and it was a great it was a great message. Um, so I have the answer really to all this, and. I'm preaching to the choir with you guys and, and Mayor Garcetti, and he's done a lot. It's The problem is the state. It's at the state level. And I think that there's some issues with the, the tax incentive. I mean, it's there. But if I'm a producer, which I hope I'm, I'm actually op op option to screenplay, you know, I'm going to try and get it done as cheap as I possibly can. It only makes economical sense. So a producer looks at the California tax incentive and he says, should I take a chance and lose the lottery or should I go somewhere where I'm not going to lose the lottery? And I know the lottery's in place and it, 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 there's a reason for it. So we're going to go all into the details of that at our next meeting. Okay. But, um, but I Talk, talk I about just, your experience, if you will. Yeah. I, I um, last week decided that I am going to pick up and move. I'm going to Atlanta. I'm probably going to go in three weeks. I have to clear up all my business here. Um, my wife and daughter are going to stay. She's still in high school. Um, we just can't uproot, so I'm going to go. And um, it's really bittersweet because I love living here. I didn't just move here to be in the business. This is, this is an incredible place to live. You know, I swim outdoors all the time, and and I don't want to live in Atlanta. I don't want to live anywhere else but here. But at this point, I have no choice. I was in Atlanta as a as an out of town hire, so they paid my travel, they paid my hotel, I got per diem, and I saw what was going on there. And there's an opportunity for, for me there, that that is just not materialized here. And I was always afraid to say I wasn't working enough because I would think that people would say well, maybe you're just not good enough, but my work is good, and I get along with people on set. It's just that this business, as you, we all know, it's, there's, a, there's luck involved. And, you know, I believe you create your own luck, but I know you guys get it. I think up north needs to get it. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. And sorry to see you go, um, but members, I think it's a, a great poignant reminder. We were speaking earlier Mr. Audley was talking about the advantages of Los Angeles, and here's some of the best advantages uh, right here, sitting at this table. The best, best crews anywhere, uh, the best talent anywhere. But when people, when all of the members of these organizations are making personal decisions that maybe they can't stay in Los Angeles anymore, maybe they need to pick up and go to New Mexico or go to Atlanta or go to Louisiana, that competitive advantage is gone, and um, it's. Uh, I think we will be past a tipping point when we see that happen to a greater extent than it, than it already is. So um, that should be one of our biggest fights to prevent. Uh, any questions for any of the folks just, here? Just Mr. one. Price? I really appreciated the uh, the, the comments. Uh, are we also lamenting? Just so I get a kind of a full picture on this. Are we also lamenting the loss of music video productions here and, and reality shows, or are we just talking about movies? Every, every, I would say everything. You know, I mean, music videos aren't as big as they used to be 20 years ago. Why? They, because they're... They don't want to spend the money. The record company doesn't fork okay. over the money. Because right. that business, we all know what's happened to that business. Um, it's just that... I'm sorry, what's happened to that business? The record, the, the music business? Oh, the music business. Yeah, the music okay. business. iTunes, that's what happened. Yeah, right. <laughs> and it's just that we, like Councilmember Krikorian said, you know, we have way more competition now for the dollars. And as Mr. Ugly said, we are getting some reality TV production here. That's great, except they don't spend any money. Right. Uh, the problem with the reality, problem. Pr reality TV, which everyone, <laughs> for reasons that defy my understanding. People in this country seem to love their reality television. But the, the result of it is, you know, they're not hiring union labor. Uh, they're not spending as much as, you know, certainly television drama does. Um, it's not this, it's just not the same as ordinary 
traditional network episodic television that has big spend budgets. Eddie? Primarily, primarily reality will shoot on location. There's no pre-production construction, which I have 2,000 prop makers who don't work on that. There's no set decoration they'll shoot. They'll come in here, they'll roll camera, come in here. It's already done or somebody's house or out on a beach. So there's really very, very little that is done. And they pay that, when I was talking earlier about a 40% drop in wages, that's reality. Yeah. And, and, and we, they have very small crews. I mean, they're, for the most part, they're, they're skeleton amount of people that they hire. And exactly. we got the big spike in uh, reality television production primarily at the time of the Writers Guild strike when this was a way to be able to produce a lot of content without having to worry with worry about uh, you know whether or not there was a strike going on and so the result is you see a continual downgrading of the of the quality of of those product well, I shouldn't say the quality in terms of you, you know what I mean the the the, yeah. the the value of those productions in terms of its economic impact yeah, it's, it's basically the hour episodic dramas are what employs the most people for television and, and, and gives us the, the biggest value for, what we, for the spend that they make to the economy. The, the reality television, which is sort of what we've been left with in a lot of cases, doesn't do any of that. It definitely is a much smaller uh, footprint on, um, on helping that economy as well. Can I say one more, one more thing? Sure. So just so you guys get the picture. So I was in Atlanta. I was working in Atlanta. Atlanta typically lives 30% back, okay? But it's, it's not 30% because the, the company, the movie company, has to sell that tax credit to a Georgia corporation, and they lose money selling that. There's a middle person. There's, a, there's brokers that buy that. They take a percentage. Now, the movie that I was working on, nothing against my union brothers and sisters in these other places, but the truth is, is that they're just not as experienced, and it takes us longer. So that 30% ain't 30%. Mr. O'Farrell, yeah, did you no, have some you. questions? Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Just, uh, I've heard that, and, and you've just reaffirmed that uh, for me. Um, uh, I just want to say two things are really coming into focus for me just with this discussion. One is the emphasis on episodic television shows and keeping them here for five years and the economic uh, generator that that is. And then the example that you gave, Mr. Kukorian, in terms of the Lakers here for three years as compared to a, a big budget film and the, um, the uh, economic growth and, and health and well-being that comes from that. And I think that in terms of the statewide approach, we need to make our case to our state friends in Sacramento that, that that same example can be given in San Francisco, Oakland, San Diego, you name it. It hurts the whole state of California. And I think that, that we refine our message to reflect that more and more and more because it's not just Southern California. It's not just the region, although, of course, we're hyper-concerned with that here in Los Angeles. But um, I think even just this brief panel discussion has helped me become a little more focused than... Uh, than I was before it began. So uh, thank you for being here and for your ideas and your, bringing your experience to bear. I just wanted to add one quick thing to answer Councilman Price's question. While it, Ed, is, uh, Ed Duffy's right, it's about numbers and that the feature films and the television episodic one hours certainly employ a lot more of our members whereas we do cover certain realities and we actually do also cover music videos. It's, it's not it's the sheer volume of numbers. And the other thing I just want to mention is you have, to, you have to remember that the shows that are historically rooted that are on the air for five years, that they're going to peter out and they're going to be replaced with shows that are not filming here. So you're going to see those go away and you're going to see film, uh, television episodics that are still here disappear. All right. Thank you all. Anything else, members? All right. Thank you, thank you all very, very much. Really thank appreciate you. your being here, and thank you for your advocacy. Uh, our next panel of speakers uh, will represent some of the vendor community that we've are just been speaking about. And uh, Ed Brown mentioned Southland Lumber, which was one of those that has recently closed. I was there when 20th Century Props closed and that magnificent collection that had been collected for generations uh, since the 
beginning of Hollywood here in Los Angeles, that incredible collection of props was put up for auction and uh, dissipated and and lost again to the to the um, we we lose again some one of the most valuable assets that we have in this industry, um, House of Props, uh, one of. LA's oldest prop house has just recently closed its doors as well. We tried to reach out to the owner, uh, Johnny Crowell, to ask him to come out here, but he's busy closing down his business, and so he couldn't come to, to testify today. So it's um, it's really heartbreaking when you hear these stories about people who've built up companies and passed them down from generation to generation. Uh, been good corporate citizens here in Los Angeles, paid their taxes, employed people for, for decades, uh, and then all of a sudden, because of this downturn in production, they're not able to maintain that and, and uh, are having to close. So I'd like to bring up uh, a few representatives of uh, some of our vendors. Uh, we'll start with Advanced Liquidators Office Furniture, Inc. Uh, Mark Goldman is their Director of Sales Operations. Um, and uh, we also have uh, Greg Strauss and Guy Botham of Hydraulics and Pam Elia of History for Hire. Welcome to all of you and thank you for coming out. Uh, and again, if you could just kind of Describe your business and a little bit about its history and what you've seen as being the impacts in recent years as production has left Los Angeles. And I'll leave it to anybody who'd... Sure. Pam? Hi. Uh, good evening. I'm Pam Elie. My husband and I own History for Hire Prop House. You can hear me fine. Or you can move pull, pull the mic over okay. to your mouth. Yeah. Uh, History for Hire Prop House. We started our business in 1984 in an apartment in Hollywood. We're now in North Hollywood in 30,000 square feet. Uh, we ship prop to, to every state and continent, and we've even done shows down in Antarctica. We have a staff of 17 people. Half of our staff is over 50 years old, and four of us are over 60 now. Um, our oldest serving employee has been with us 23 years. Our newest three years, and on average, most of the staff has been with us 10 years. So we are, a, we are definitely a family. Um, what I'd like to do is, is tell you about the things, some very specific things about um, our small business in the past year and really get into some details as far as the economics of our business goes. Um, the majority of our incomes comes from commercials, print production, and episodic television. Um, clients that film locally, clients that do what we call tag and drag. And a tag and drag is you walk in the door, you say these are the props I want, the truck comes and takes it with them later. When I look at feature films, um, they are, which are about 40% of my business, it's less about tag and drag and more about tag and ship. And we have been shipping to, uh, this year we ship to Europe, we ship to uh, Canada, and a, a great deal to the south and to New York. Um, I want to talk to you about my top five spenders this year in 2003. Um, starting at the bottom of the top five was Mob City, which was an episodic TV show. It was six episodes on the Turner Movie Channel. Um, it all filmed in Los Angeles, a lot in it at Universal Studios. Um, it was a good client. Unfortunately, it, it didn't last the test, so the six episodes are going to be it, and it won't be coming back. Um, Anchorman 2 filmed in Georgia, Paramount Picture. Anchorman 1 had filmed in Los Angeles. It filmed at Sealy Studios, which is in Glendale. Uh, Fox uh, did X-Men up in Canada. The issue with us shipping to Canada is whatever I ship up there, Canada takes a 10% tax. So whatever I charge, Canada is going to take 10% off the top. iVox Entertainment, uh, Get On Up, which was the James Brown story. This is interesting. It's a New York art department filming a movie about a man who lived in Georgia, but they're filming it in Mississippi. And that was also one of our big clients. And uh, my biggest client of the year, I'm happy to say, was Georgie Bo Jersey Boys, filmed in California. That was Clint Eastwood. Um, of these, these top five, uh, one of the things I want to let you know is that even as vendors, we use vendors. And we take a client like Get On Up, and I pulled the figures for what we did on Get On Up. I had $25,000 in local sales to local vendors on that show. 
and these are vendors, um, individuals who maybe I brought bases from or guitars. And even when, I, even when we buy on PayPal or local vendors, I always pay a use tax on these. So the state is getting a use tax on what we buy. Uh, we shopped at California Vintage Guitar, Classic Amp, uh, Electronic City. Unfortunately, that's one of those small businesses that's fallen by the wayside and closed in December. Uh, Michael's, we'll go to Home Depot, Joanne's Fabrics, uh, Burkott Manufacturing that just does cast, little casters that go on the bottom of our big things, uh, Big Lots, Burbank Paints, Supply Sergeant, Kmart, Target. So we're all over the place. We're shopping at big box stores and little individuals. But that's $25,000 that was just spent locally. Um, I would say that what we need as vendors in Hollywood is, is really two things from, from government. I think we're all pretty good at marketing our, our businesses to our clientele. Um, the first thing would be to maintain the Hollywood brand. That's a very strong brand and a good cachet for a business to have. I have people shop me because I'm in Hollywood. I'm really in North Hollywood, but we, we, we spell the North really small, so they think it's just Hollywood. Um, I remember when we were doing The Artist, and the director for The Artist came out here, and he was at our business looking around, and he was a huge director in France, and I said, he was doing the artist, and I said, you know, you don't need to shoot here. Come on, you're from France. It's some Yay brothers. You could have done it there. And he said, oh, Pam, I've always wanted to shoot in Hollywood. So the brand really means something. Um, and it, what it means is it means you're playing at the top of the game, I think, that you have the best crews, the best facilities, the best vendors, and you have the best city and state infrastructure that works together and speaks with one voice. Uh, the other thing I would ask is that uh, our state government maintains a level playing ground with the other states so that we're all competing on the same levels. That we, if not matching the tax incentives, and in somehow create a way that we're not having such a great disparity. Um, I certainly would like to see the incentives uh, raised, um, and I would also like to see them include commercials. Thank you very much. All right, thank you very much. Thanks for being here. Um, Greg or Guy? Key. So my name is Key Bothman. Key, sorry. Key, no problem. And notwithstanding my accent, I am a local. I've been here since 1989, uh, 25 years. I'd like to thank you for inviting us. We represent the uh, visual effects, California-based visual effects companies. Um, and there's no question that we've seen a profound change in our business over the last 10 years. Um, and it's fueled in large measure, if not solely, by the tax subsidies and credits being offered for production and post-production in states and countries outside California. I'm all about movies being made, um, given the escalating budgets for major Hollywood films, which is a lot of it's driven by um, visual effects, <coughs> compelling visual effects, and the market pressures faced by the movie industry to compete for the consumer dollars. It is understandable and it's smart that the studios have to consider relative tax advantages when um, considering where to shoot and produce their movies. The tax incentives and credits go directly to the bottom line for the studios, and often that can make the difference between green lighting and not green lighting a movie. So it's a key component of financing. The challenge is that the California tax incentives are not keeping up, are not competitive um, enough to keep productions at home which means that we have opened in Canada, in New York, New Orleans, and we are opening in London. Uh, and we're scaling back our operations in Los Angeles. The tax subsidies being offered outside California create a virtuous cycle, um, I would say, for these communities. Specifically, the investment made by the production helps drive local commerce, and it enhances the community profile, because we all know that movie making is sexy. Um, and most importantly, it helps build real employment and skilled labor opportunities. And the UK visual effects business is a great example. The companies there um, didn't have a talent pool to draw on when we first started competing with them. And now, because of the tax incentives, they have created a formidable and talented workforce that is competitive even without the tax incentives. And this virtuous cycle is what drives ever uh, more countries to come to the tax subsidy table. And they woo major Hollywood projects to be produced on their soils. 
and of course the studios have a fiduciary responsibility um, to make the movies at the lowest cost. So I'm here to encourage you to recognize the benefits of a new California tax policy that could draw production back home. Um, such a company would help our, our, our company hire more Californians. At our peak six years ago, we employed 150 people, and now we employ 40. Oof. And I think we can get there again with tax subsidies. Um, I firmly believe that the studios want to work here in California, and certainly the people we've heard from, the union workers, the producers, editors, actors, uh, from their perspective, they want to spend more time here with their families. And I think for this human reason, Los Angeles would have a huge home field advantage. For landing movies, if we could just have a competitive tax subsidy structure that would promote the industry. So thank you for the opportunity to speak. And you do have uh, facilities in Canada, you have facilities here. Can you talk a little bit about in the last five years or so ago, can you quantify? Yeah, I'll, let me let my partner, Greg. I'll, okay. I'll take that. My name is Greg Strauss. Um, my brother and I are the owners of Hydraulics. Um, let, me, let me just rewind a little bit, and then I, I can get into what's happened to our business over the last five years, because okay. I think that's where we've seen the, the most extreme change. But uh, basically, my brother and I grew up in the suburbs of Chicago. Uh, we always wanted to be in Hollywood. We wanted to make films. Uh, when we were, I was 20 years old, we started sending out our demo reel got hired, moved to L.A., and never went back. My parents came out to visit us. They sold the house and never went back to Chicago either. <clears throat> we started off as a two-man operation, uh, moved to Pacific Palisades. It became a four-man operation. It became a 12-man operation. We, uh, within two years of being here, got to meet Jim Cameron and work on Titanic, who was our childhood idol, and we, you know, that movie was obviously very successful. We built the company uh, to a 30-man operation, to a 60-man operation, and to eventually to 150 people, as, as Guy mentioned. Um, and that, hit, that was about the peak. <clears throat> Starting around 2010, which was our best year, we started seeing a very aggressive pursuit of the tax credits by the studios. And we, our business used to be split evenly between music video, TV commercial, visual effects, and feature film. Uh, Napster took care of the music video side and pretty much wiped that out. It's been covered a little bit earlier tonight. Um, <clears throat> and as feature films, visual effects became bigger and bigger, more important draw, the budgets have become enormous. If you look at the ratio, on a given $150 million film right now, more than $50 million of that 150 will be spent on visual effects. It is, on, on, a, on a big summer tent pole movie, the biggest department on the film. Um, <clears throat> what we've seen since 2010, though, is every one of our competitors uh, in Southern California systematically you know, destroyed. We've seen Rhythm and Hughes after winning the Oscar go Chapter 11. They had a presence of an excess I've heard of 750 people in El Segundo. It's now a fraction of that. Um, the list goes, I mean, you have Asylum, The Orphanage, um, Digital Domain went Chapter 11 a couple of years. That was a premier brand in the industry. It still is. But you've got, you know, we have something very strange going on where visual effects is becoming a bigger and bigger part of movie budgets and the studios are spending more and more money and everyone based in California is going Chapter 11. <clears throat> My brother and I eventually had to succumb to the pressure. We had to start a division in Vancouver. Um, Vancouver, the, uh, the city is very aggressive. They have marketing efforts. They have luncheons with the mayor. Uh, the mayor explains about their efforts of schools that are, you know, just <clears throat> producing the hundreds if not thousands of skilled techni technicians and artists strictly with the idea of stealing the visual effects work out of Southern California. They're, you know, they've been very aggressive about it. They're also very successful at it now. Um, we're, you know, we've moved about, at our peak, probably about 80 jobs up to Vancouver. But again, it doesn't just stop there. We have productions that pressure us to do it in Louisiana. So now I have an office in New Orleans. We now have an office in New York. We now have an office in London. I've never wanted to do that. My, you know, my brother and I have our families based here in LA. Our house is here. Um, my brother just took a studio job that he had to move to Australia for five months. So while I'm going to get to help um, take his care of his kids over the next five months because he has to go and do that work. 
the irony of that is that movie set takes place in LA and San Francisco and California. We need a state incentive to claw this business back. Um, now, in parallel with this story of the sort of success cycle of our visual effects company, my brother and I uh, became directors. We directed two feature films. We've also financed several films, and the movies we've directed have made over $200 million worldwide. Um, one of those we produced and financed. And the interesting thing is there was another movie that we produced and financed in 2012. And I opened Variety one day and saw that our feature had the most permitted shoot days in Los Angeles that year. The problem is that that feature, the budget for that movie was under $200,000 for the entire film. Yet we had the most permitted days in LA. So you can look at statistics like, oh, the shoot days look good. But those aren't the kind of shoot days that we want here. We want the $200 million movies. I mean, our effects company, what we work on is Avengers, Avatar, uh, the Pirates of the Caribbean. We work on all these 200, 300 plus million dollar movies, but we can't get any of that work in LA right now. We want it here. We're committed. We love California, but that, that train has left the station. We need to get it back. Thank you. Thanks very much. Mark Goldman. <coughs> Excuse me. Hello. Thank you guys for uh, Welcome. getting involved in all this. Uh, my name is Mark Goldman, and I'm the owner of Advanced Liquidators uh, Office Furniture and Studio, <coughs> Studio Rentals. We uh, have been in business, <coughs> we opened the same time Pam did. Uh, my father opened the company in 1984. And um, Pam pretty much said it all, and you guys have been saying it all. Our specialty is, uh, we're a prop house, and our specialty is police stations, FBI's, and our bread and butter is the one-hour dramas. We employed, we were up to about 23 employees. We had to lay some back. The, the pivotal point was, I think it was two or three years ago, when there was 15 new dramas that were picked up, and only two, there was big articles, only two were staying in town. And what comes to mind are big shows, you've probably heard of, like Breaking Bad, Left Town, in New Mexico, Homeland, which is gigantic in North Carolina, and House of Cards, the new film, is in Maryland. And those are three shows where if they were in town, I'd probably have to hire another five people. Because when I watch those shows, it is just nothing but offices and police stations, FBI's, and that's what we do. And so, um, that's, uh, that's pretty much the basis uh, of, of what we do. Um, and when the shows leave town, it just kills us all. Not to repeat what everyone says, it's just, it's just simple math. Uh, if the shows leave, it affects us all, we all make less money, and it's harder for us to survive. Um, the other thing that's never mentioned, I don't know if it matters, but uh, our revenues that year when the dramas left dropped about 20%. And that hurts the state, you know, the state gets 9% of all my rentals. So if we were doing $7 million, uh, in sales and then it drops to about 45 because all these dramas left, uh, the state doesn't get a lot of money. And then all the other money we would spend, because just like Pam said, when, uh, like for example, Criminal Minds is our number one show. Uh, whatever they need, we make happen. So when they send an order, we have to go spend money everywhere to put it together, like Home Depot and Lowe's. I'm at Home Depot and Lowe's or my crew all the time. So that's pretty much it. We just have to bring it back, and it helps everybody. But that, that was our pivotal point when our specialty is the one-hour dramas, and when they left, it, it really took a toll. Yeah. Again, this is a very important point. What I said at the outset that we have three times as many entertainment industry businesses as we do Starbucks in California. Nobody thinks of Home Depot as being an entertainment industry Absolutely. business. But, and that's not included in those numbers. But in fact, all of those sorts of support businesses that all of you rely upon are directly impacted when your business is impacted as well. So members, questions? Thank you, Mr. Farrell. 
Thank you all very much. Thank you for being in Los Angeles. Oh, and, and Pam, never put the North smaller than Hollywood. <laughs> North Hollywood is good. Everybody loves North Hollywood. Thank you. But thank you all for being here, and thank you for your testimony. Uh, I'd like to go now to our, our public comment cards, because there's a lot of people, and it's really good to, to look out at this crowd and see how many people who are here to, to talk about this really important issue. Usually in council meetings when we have public comment, uh, we have two minutes per speaker, but I would like to make it three minutes to make sure that you can tell as much of your story as you would like to. You don't need to take all three, but, um, but we'll try to have as much flexibility as we can. Uh, as our speakers come up. So our first speaker will be Marilyn Bittner, followed by Daryl Sparky Herzon. Ms. Bittner, welcome. Thank you, Chairman Gregorian. And uh, thank you to the other council members. And thank you to Mitch O'Farrell, whose office late last night let me know about this. Thank you. Um, I ho own a location service, Plan A Locations, and when I started my business in 1999, about 80% of my revenue came from hour-long episodic TV. And I think I'm mir mirroring, mirroring the um, percentage that it's dropped because it's now 30%. What's filling in is commercials, and we have a load of commercials going on, which don't hire the same number of crews. And they don't, um, they don't incur the kind of services that an hour-long episodic does. I'm also getting things that are not great job creators. Now, it, it works fine for my business, but it doesn't spill over. I'm getting low-budget films, which are too small to go and qualify for uh, other state incentives. And I'm getting big-budget films, like the campaign, which come back to edit and then they realize that there's two locations missing and 20 minutes of their, you know, in four minutes of their film missing, and they're only out on location for two or three weeks, and then they pack up and go back into the editing room. So it's a whole new paradigm. They don't spend the money here. They make a $150 million film spending, you know, maybe $2 million in L.A., and the other $148 million in Louisiana. So those jobs and all are lost. Also, when a business like mine works, a location works, if we're working in a home or an office, it's not just my business and, and my locations that profit. There's a layout board company that comes in and puts down cardboard and mats. They, they have workers. They have a cleaning crew that has five or ten workers. They have repair crews when they do damage, and occasionally they do damage, um, very occasionally. Um, but there, there are, when we go into a neighborhood, if they're there more than one or two days, the location managers that are very well trained um, send out baskets. So it's not uncommon, uncommon for in a neighborhood like one of the gated communities that I represent to have 25 baskets from one of the local vendors. It's an enormous multiplier. And we just don't have the size productions that we did so that that multiplier is really felt tremendously. And I want to thank you all for being concerned enough to hold these hearings. Thank you very much. Appreciate your being here. Our next speaker is Daryl Sparky Herzon, followed by Roger Latin. Good evening, gentlemen. Thank you very much. I don't know where to begin. I'll start by saying that I'm a native Californian, born in 1950 and served in the Army. Uh, my family has all been in show business for as long as I can remember. Um, my, my great uncle was Al Hirschfeld, who made so many people so very famous. I, in 1979, got a call while attending Cal State Northridge um, to become a permit for the motion picture set lighting department at Universal Studios. And what I would like to state, as um, uh, business agent Ed Brown mentioned, Local 728, that set lightings local 720 is 728 is the only recognized set lighting union of the united states we find it i i believe i speak for our members we find it very insulting and 
demeaning when we have to ship our most talented people because they can't get work here out to the other states. I can name names. I don't know if it's necessary, but just last week at, at one of our meetings, I asked one of the best rigging gaffers in our industry, what have you been doing? Are you working here? He says, no, I can't get a job here. I have to go to Atlanta and I'm not leaving my family. I thought, my God, this is craziness. Um, I, I'm a member of the executive board for 720, and I have been so, I think, for seven to ten years. We were at a meeting, and one of our executive board members stated that he was earning $11.11 per hour, because that's all that was available here. But it was work, and he was getting his health benefits. Got, um, I think what I'm trying to say is that I grew up here. I've seen the changes. My mentor, Dusty Huber, once told me, Sparky, get out. It's going downhill. I said, why? He says, because everybody's leaving. Because the prices that L.A. charges to film on the streets, the prices they charge for the police officers to guard us, firemen, are outrageous. Locations are outrageous. Prices are outrageous. I said, the solution is for our legislators to give the producers our streets, give them our police and fire departments at reasonable rates. Nobody's asking for free. But don't charge $500 per day for a man to work eight hours. Um, city permits, give it to them. Bring the work back to Los Angeles. It's, it's Hollywood. It's where we belong. Um, that's all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, our next speaker is Roger Latin, followed by Lynn Kowahara. Good evening. Hi, my name is Roger Latin. I'm a member of IATSE Local 728. We are the only set lighting technicians local in the world, not just in the United States. Anyway, um, I was born in Northern California, spent some time on the East Coast and came back to get into Hollywood. I spent 10 years trying to break into the movie industry. When I did, I became a member of Local 728. I noticed that there were some problems. I'm a graduate electrical engineer. I saw some problems. We started a training program over 20 years ago. We went to the city electrical inspectors. We worked with them. We want to make our guys more professional. They said, hey, we got a guy that used to be one of your members. Let him help you do it. We've got the best and safest crews in the world. Okay? We do. We've worked with the city to make it happen. Okay? We've worked with the electrical, city electrical inspector. We've worked with the fire department. We've come up with better ways of doing things, okay? If we don't do something, it's going to go away. One of the things that I saw on the state, uh, the governor's and the lieutenant governor's websites was that there's eight pillars that they've got to improve California. The film industry holds six of those eight pillars. I won't... I don't have the time to do the details on that. I detailed it in a three-page letter to both the governor and to the lieutenant governor. The reply I got was, thank you, we received your letter. No other response. I'm just a graduate electrical engineer, okay? I can't do anything anymore, okay? The only thing I know now is film and television. I've been a member of our local for 25 years. We've worked to improve the quality and the safety of what we do in Los Angeles with the city. I can pretty much tell you that in East Tree Stump, Louisiana, Georgia, New York, it's up near Lake Placid, I guess, um, none of those locals have gone to their authorities having jurisdiction commonly known as the electrical inspector or the fire inspectors, and worked with them to work the community. This is a community. We need, it's one thing for the city to do something. I've got a whole bunch of notes on that. 
we need to do something at the state level. Thank you very much, sir. Our next speaker is Lynn Kuwahara, followed by Danielle Brazil. Hello, my name is Lynn Kuwahara. Uh, when I'm working, I'm a location manager. I'm a resident of CD10. I've been a Teamster since 1979. I attended USC Film School. When I started in the business, the work was steady. There was a future there. Now it's so slow. It's a split between location manager and unemployment. Um, I would like to retire before I die. Three years ago, I attended a meeting, um, same topic, uh, different faces, and apparently no progress. So I'm going to repeat what I said at that meeting was, I went to LA High School, and this was when the school was a beautiful building and not a low security prison. They used to shoot a TV show called Room 222 there. And I would look out and I'd say, I can do that. I don't know what they're doing, but I can do that. So I, somehow I got to USC Film School, which was incredible because I was the only one of two women and one of three Asians there at the time. Now that minority kids have learned that they can express themselves, that they don't have to be silent anymore, where are they going to express themselves? There's no jobs. They're going to go to film school, and they aren't going to work once they get out. Their, their degrees will be useless, and they'll be doing webisodes. I, you know, where, where are they going to go? At the Academy Awards that are coming up, the two directors who are the front runners, one is from Mexico, the other is from England. One is Mexican, the other is a, I can't say African American, um, but he's a black gentleman from England. I mean, those are our role models now, people from minorities from out of the country. I recently had to get in touch with Larry, the lunchbox guy. He rents trailers that pop out so that instead of putting up a tent for lunch, the trailer comes out with a Teamster driver and you can go inside and it's very nice and comfortable. And he wasn't answering his office phone. So finally I get hold of him. I said, Larry, why aren't you answering your office phone? And he said, because I'm in Atlanta. I have more trailers in Atlanta than I have in LA. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ben. Uh, our next speaker is Daniel Brazil, followed by Kaiser Clark. Hi, good evening. Um, my name is Danielle Brazel. I'm the executive director of Arts for LA. And you three usually see me when I'm pitching you to support arts and arts education at the state and local level. Um, but I'm here tonight to support the efforts around this issue. Um, we often see our creative communities as separate, for-profit, non-profit, film, commercial, etc. The reality is, is that we're really all in this together. And Los Angeles is fueled by creativity. And how that creativity manifests um, is up to the creative minds and the industry professionals and the students that are in our schools that deserve to have arts education to one day have an opportunity to be a part of this incredible industry. Um, Los Angeles is unique. We have over 80,000 artists working in Los Angeles. And the thing with LA is that we cross over. We work nonprofit, we volunteer, and then we go commercial. And the two just aren't as separate. I think what we can do as, uh, with Arts for LA, number one, is we can support the bill 1839. Um, and as a C3, you know, we can take action on specific legislation. Um, but I think that we can send a message to our partners up in the north 
that this is not just a Southern California industry specific uh, issue, that this is actually something that's going to benefit everybody in California. And I think that's an important message, that we are the creative capital of the United States, Los Angeles, but, La but California as a whole needs to invest in our creativity. Um, and there's a direct relationship between workforce development, creative energy, entrepreneurism, this industry, and, uh, and prosperity for everyone in Los Angeles or California. So it's a win-win for all. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Uh, our next speaker is Kaiser Clark, followed by Daniel Lay. Mr. Clark, welcome. Thank you. I'm Kaiser Clark. I'm um, a member of the Teamster Union 399. Uh, I'm here because I've got some time on my hands. I'm not employed right now. And I'd like to do anything I can to uh, help this uh, process along. Um, a union member in my position, in my uh, seniority, six years ago to work about 10 months out of the year, maybe uh, 12, they're really hitting it hard. Last year, I worked four months. That's it. So I'm employed. Um, I don't work out of town because they don't take all of the all of the drivers out of town. I have worked out of town and that was, you know, it was good. It was a job. Um, but I missed my wife for four months. Um, last year, around August, I was about ready to move to Georgia, leave my union and leave my seniority and start at the bottom at the local there in Georgia, in Atlanta. And I would have gotten a lot of work, a lot of work. Thank goodness there were some jobs that came up and I did end up working four months out of the year and I was really really happy for that um, Avatar was the, uh, the sequel to Avatar was set up um, to shoot in Manhattan Beach Studios it was going to shoot for a number of years, not shoot for a number of years but we could have worked on that for a number of years that's gone, I think it's gone to New Zealand, I'm not really sure but they're cleaning out those stages now um, if someone from you know, the state of California had a conversation with who's ever setting up those budgets and was saying, look, this is leaving. Perhaps something could have been done. Uh, as a Teamster, you know, sometimes I'll go ahead and, and go to the car wash. And at the car washes, I see that car washes will honor uh, coupons from other car washes based on their price. Why can't the state of California do something like that? Thanks. Thank you, sir. Our next speaker is Daniel Lay, followed by Leslie Simon. Thank you. Good evening. Sorry if that's too loud. Uh, my name is Daniel Lay, and I'm the writer behind the blog VFX Soldier. And I am part of an organization called the Association of Digital Artists, Professionals, and Technicians called ADAPT. You can visit our website at adaptvfx.org. Uh, I've worked in the visual effects industry for 10 years. I actually, I used to work for uh, Greg Strauss here uh, at Hydraulics for a short stint. Um, I wanted to uh, let you know about some of the massive amount of injury that's occurring to the vendors uh, here in Los Angeles. Uh, as you know, Rhythm and Hughes uh, went bankrupt, and within two weeks, uh, they actually won the Oscar last year. Uh, the company I used to work for, Digital Domain, recently went bankrupt also. Uh, Sony Pictures Image Works, which usually has around 1,000 visual effects workers, now it's down to probably less than 200. Those workers there have been given an ultimatum on March 3rd to either move to British Columbia or they will be fired. Okay? Why are they trying to move all the work to British Columbia? Well, the reason why is because the government there will pay 60% of their salaries to have them go there. Okay? The reason I want to let you know this is to let you know how expensive this is. When people say, let's compete, let's compete with other locations, like the individual here who said, you know, we should just honor a coupon, consider that other car wash if they're willing to pay 60% of those prices. It can be very expensive. British Columbia alone spent $450 million just last year trying to lure the industry there. And so I started looking at alternatives. Two years ago, I flew out to Washington, D.C. I met with a Washington-based law firm that specializes in international trade law. Our group is trying to fund an effort which will challenge these international subsidies in the U.S. Court of International Trade. And what we hope to do is that if we can prove to this panel of judges that number one, we have the support of the domestic visual effects industry, and number two, that we have able to prove injury, a mandatory duty will be placed against any producer who tries to utilize these international subsidies. 
So what am I proposing here? Uh, this will not affect any effort by the state of California to pass subsidies. But what I would like to propose is a take five. Take 5% and try to fund these kind of legal efforts because these are small investments that can lead to huge returns. I don't need 5%. I would say the cost of this effort would probably end up becoming one quarter of 1% of the cost of this program that you're proposing. So I just wanted to let you know that it would be great if we could support that effort. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, next speaker is Leslie Simon, followed by Allison Young. Hi, I'm Leslie Simon. I'm uh, the new business rep at IATSE Local 871. Um, our local represents production accountants, pr uh, coordinators, production coordinators, script supervisors, art department coordinators, a number of people who are traveled to work out of state. They're not. A number of our, our members are not the members who stay in L.A. They're, they are moved, they do work, and they're working very regularly. And as a new business rep, I've seen my, my first order of business was to reach out to my members and to learn what their issues are. And what was amazing to me as I'm doing that is as I reach out, as many of them are out of the state working as they are here in LA. They don't have time to meet with me because they're not here. I'm having phone conversations with people rather than lunch, rather than a meeting. And many of them have sent me their stories saying, I can't be there to testify in Sacramento. I can't be there to talk about what's happening to me, although some of them are here tonight and will be speaking. Um, but they tell me their stories. I spoke with a woman who is a coordinator who for the last three years has not worked in Los Angeles at all, but has worked continually. So what she decided to do was give up her apartment, and she stays obviously in hotels. She's put up by the production companies. And when she comes to LA for a visit to her home, she stays with friends. And then she goes on to her next show, because she doesn't think it's worth paying rent for an apartment that she doesn't have time to be at. Um, I have another member who talked to me. She had just come back from working on a production in North Carolina, and she came back to her home in Los Angeles, and she had a week or two, and she could meet with me. But then she needed to pack up to go to her next job, which was going to be in Maryland. Um, I have another woman who spoke with me. She's a married woman, and her husband is also an accountant, two accountants in the industry. Um, they used to be um, very happy. One of them could be at home, um, while the other one had to travel for work. Um, what's happened recently is both of them need to be out of town working on a regular basis. Their next gig in the next, I think, next week or two, one of them is going to Hungary, the other is going to Louisiana. And they've made a deal with each other that they want to see each other at least once a month when they're working away from each other, and they can't do that on this gig. Um, it is, you know, I, I was out of the industry for um, eight years working for a public sector union, and I know what it means in terms of the state budget and what we need to do to fund public services. If our members were back here working in Los Angeles, spending their money here, if the production companies were spending money here, we would have money for schools, we have money for higher education. I thank you for your, this committee. I look forward to going with you to Sacramento and testifying on this issue and bringing production home. Thank you very much. Our next speaker is Allison Young, followed by Alan Apone. Hi, my name is Allison Young. I am almost a third generation Californian. I have lived in Los Angeles since 1983 and working in the industry. I'm a member of Local 871 and a script supervisor since 1992-94. My husband is also a member of Local 729. We both work in below the line positions. We own a home in Silver Lake. Uh, in 2012, looking for my next gig, I lost two to three, if not more, jobs with producers who I had worked with in the past who would have been happy to hire me, but their shows were going to be shooting out of town, and the studios had dictated, you can't hire, you can't travel people. Even if they wanted to travel me, they had to hire locally. So I lost, I don't know how many jobs, because the shows were going out of town and that was it, too bad. Um, I did a pilot that shot locally, 
And uh, when it got picked up, it was about two L.A. cops, but they were going to shoot it in New Orleans. So again, I was going to lose a job that was mine because they were going to New Orleans. Uh, and I needed, at the same time, our hours and our benefits were increased. So in order to keep my health insurance benefits, I had to work more hours than I had to previously, and there were less jobs available. I decided I had to take it on myself and go to New Orleans on my dime. And, you know, the, I'm told, well, you should go, the, you know, and, and they should travel you and they should pay your expenses, but they won't. I just wouldn't get the job. So I went to New Orleans and I rented an apartment and my husband stayed here and we were separated for six months while I was there working. Um, and I had to do that to, to get the hours, you know, and luckily I've been back lately and I've been able to work home, but I feel like we, you know, the industry is changing to the point that we need to go where the jobs are. And that takes, you know, money from local. I'm not, I'm not here spending anything, I'm spending in, Louisiana. So, I, you know, I, I don't know. To me, it, this should have been done by the state five, six years ago. They're, they're late, and I hope we can make it up, and, you know. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Ms. Young. Uh, next, we're going to have um, Alan Apone, followed by Josh Siegel. Uh, good evening. Uh, my name is Alan Apone. I'm a member of Local 706. I'm a makeup artist. Um, most of my career, I've I've been traveling, um, but really, in the last 10 years, um, I've spent each year <clears throat> probably a good 10 months on the road. Um, it directly caused my divorce uh, just from being gone, as my uh, wife didn't want an absent husband, and I understand that. And I tried to think, okay, well, let me try to get a job in town. Let me see what I could do. But there wasn't anything. There wasn't anything that I could do. But I did have a clientele that, you know, took me out of town. I work not only as a department head. Um, I work as a personal request makeup artist. And I'm very fortunate to have the career that I have. But a lot of my friends and some of that are here tonight um, don't have that. They don't have, that, you know, that luxury of... of somebody wanting you to be there with them. Um, so consequently, some of my friends who are the highest regarded makeup and hairstylists in the industry can't work. They can't get a job because everything's gone. And, I mean, we've heard it all night so far. Um, I, I'm originally from New Jersey. I came here as a kid, 10 years old. Uh, we moved to Culver City. I lived between Desilu and MGM. And I used to play in the black back locks all the time. And I used to think, oh, wow, wouldn't this be great one day to work in this industry? Um, now, I have kids coming up to me who are training to be makeup artists and hairstylists, and they go, gosh, you know, what can we do to be in the industry? And I said, here's the first thing you have to le learn. You're going to enter a profession that doesn't need you anymore because there are no jobs. There are 20, about 2,500, I'm going to say, makeup and hairstylists, and... I, can't, I don't even know the percentage that are working, but most of them aren't. They can't get a job. So all these students that are coming out of schools to learn a craft that it seems like a lot of producers don't care about the crafts anymore, any of the crafts. Um, and when they ask me honestly, what can we be doing? And I just say, you know, I don't know. You, you're entering a profession that really doesn't have a job for you. Hopefully just try hard and maybe you can get something. But I work a lot out of town, and we get into the, the fact of, you know, we're actually training people to take our jobs. But they don't even care about the job. It's, you know, to them, it's, it's a widget almost. It's like, the, you know, they're, they're occupying space. There's no passion. There's no drive. You know, they've just, they've got a job. And I know they're trying to feed their families as well. Um, but we, I'm really happy that you guys are trying to do something, and I look forward to seeing the result. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. Our next speaker is Josh Siegel, followed by Timothy Hillman. Welcome. Hi. Thank you. Um, my name is Josh. I'm a, I'm a line producer. I um, 
I work generally on independent films. Um, if you don't know what a line producer is, um, basically I'm the guy who does all the logistics behind the movie. The producers raise the money and the line producer spends the money. So it's, it's all the um, vendors hiring, firing, unions, um, all, all the nuts and bolts that go into the production. A um, big component of the job is um, problem solving. Um, and so coming at it from that perspective as a line producer, seeing the problem that we have here, um, I think it's definitely solvable. Um, you know, you, you look at all the different components and at, at the end of the day, like when somebody tells me we have X amount of dollars to make a movie, how are we going to do it? And I look at that and I say, well, you know, we'll, we'll do this, we'll do that. And I, I think we can do it. Um, I think we can solve this problem. Um, I think a lot of it, a lot of the issue hasn't been addressed, and I, I was actually heartened to hear that in what sounds like your third meeting, you're, you're going to address um, uh, a lot of the issues because the tax incentive itself is really just the tip of the iceberg. Um, there are lots of other factors. I mean, years and years ago when I first started, um, uh, back in the late 90s, uh, there was a program called Film California First that there were properties like this room that you could just walk into and film. And for an independent production, like most of the ones that um, I work on, um, that's of immense value. Uh, the production value, obviously, of a space like this, and I work on, you know, like, say, two or three million dollar movie, we don't, we can't build this. It's not in our budget. So to be able to walk into a place like this and film it was for free. Um, sometimes you'd have to hire a CHP officer. Um, it was it was completely wonderful. And productions that couldn't have happened, at least at that budget level, were able to happen. Um, I, I do want to impress upon you two other other things um, that might be overlooked when 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 considering the tax incentive. I don't. I, I'm not. Um, you know, fully familiar with the legislature that's, uh, legislation that's being put forward now, but um, I, I would impress upon you that um, as good as, of a start as the current incentive is, um, to me, just from a numbers perspective, and I guess, again, I'm biased because I come from the indie world, um, productions that um, say you have a $30 million movie and you get a tax incentive, that's wonderful, they should get a tax incentive, but the benefit to that if you were able to fund, say, 10 $3 million movies, just from a job creation standpoint, you get a lot more bang for your buck being able to make 10 movies rather than one. It's not to say that the one shouldn't get made. Um, I, I'm just trying to say that there needs to be system in place, I know my time's up, to, to be able to get the small movies made that otherwise wouldn't get made. Uh, I have more ideas, but uh, I'm well, sorry. And, and we're looking forward to hearing them. And uh, we have two more opportunities for that. So, and and then in the in the interim, by all means, you know, we're all accessible by email. We all have websites. We all welcome uh, your. If you don't want to come and speak today, that's fine. Please share these sorts of thoughts, like uh, the the cost reduction ideas that some people have talked about. And by the way, there's a lot of filming that goes on in this building. I'm pleased to say this building has stood in for. Um, Congress. It's stood in for many different police headquarters. It's even stood in for the Vatican. So I, I was especially, I, I can't figure that one out, but it has. Um, all right, thank you. Our next speaker is Timothy Hillman, followed by John Hayes. Is Mr. Hillman still here? No? Okay. Um, John Hayes, followed by Sue Cabral Ebert. I'm going to be a bit of a possible uh, contrarian here, I suppose, but I have to uh, make some of these points just to have a wider perspective. Um, isn't this bill just an example of more short-sighted, knee-jerk corporate welfare? Uh, isn't this merely an attempt to treat the symptom, not the disease, to win the battle but lose the war while missing the forest for the trees? Enough with the metaphors. Production companies wouldn't seek incentives if they weren't part of the profit factor. So saying this bill is about average workers in the industry is incidental, but a useful tool for politicians, the MPAA, and whomever helps fund the campaigns of said politicians. It's a great way to get the crowds riled up and get the votes that you need. 
if and when this bill passes, I expect there will be uh, competitors who will up the ante, New York and all the other states. So uh, what point will it stop? Will we have 100% rebates and tax breaks? Since productions are already partially funded by the government and thus the public, why aren't we getting a matching cut of the profits in return? As for uh, our unions, of course, uh, they rep represent members across, uh, members across the nation and many in Canada. They get their dues either way, and the more members they get, wherever they can get them, the better for their bottom line. Unlike the crews who don't get to vote for the myriad side letter agreements for miscellaneous productions which reduce our pay and our other perks, our union officials don't suffer salary cuts as far as I know. So can we try to think about this from a wider perspective, this syndrome of kickbacks and counter kickbacks and just a big game of kickball with the money? Can we find a way to end the subsidies across the board to enable a more level playing field for all of us? How about looking into the Commerce Clause of the U.S. Constitution, for starters? Uh, I think we should have a, maybe an ad hoc committees of some kind to come up with some more creative solutions. Since we are a creative community, I would hope there would be a way to find some solution to this subsidy work, because it just goes on and on. All we're going to do is generate more battles like this with other states. And I don't see, a, I don't see it benefiting anybody except the wealthy more than anybody else. Of course, we're collateral benefits to us, but again, ultimately it's in the interest of major corporations it's more than it is uh, the average worker. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and we don't do back and forth during public comment, but just as a, as a side note, um, there's, in a perfect world where there were no subsidies anywhere, um, that would probably be to everyone's advantage, but we don't live in that world, unfortunately. And um, 15 years ago, I remember efforts being made then to challenge Canada's uh, incentives as contrary to the Commerce Clause and contrary to, to uh, or con uh, uh, trade policy. And you know, 15 years later, the problem has only gotten significantly worse, uh, and there's now over 30 other countries uh, that are participating in this, as well as 40 states that wouldn't be impacted by that in any event. So, And by the way, as inadequate as it may be, uh, the current California Film and Television Production Tax Incentive uh, that I authored is um, producing more than a dollar in benefits of revenues for state and local government than it costs. So it's actually, we are getting a cut of the profits, if you will, in the economic activity that it's created uh, that's returning more revenues to the tax coffers than it actually costs. So, and that's been established now by at least, you know, two, by UCLA, by RAND and others. So, Sue, welcome. Thank you. Good to see you again. It's good to see you. We've seen you in Sacramento, we've seen you in LA, we've seen you at the Hollywood Chamber of Commerce, we saw you to a, at our rally. We thank you for joining with all of us. And I think with our combined efforts, it's gonna be a much, much stronger, much more manageable situation and hopefully we'll make inroads in Sacramento and get our Northern California brothers and sisters as well. Um, we gotta get the legislators up there to really pay, pay attention to our plight and the fact that we are losing thousands and thousands of jobs. And in, as you, all of you know, I am also the co-chairman uh, co of the Legislative Action Committee for the Hollywood Chamber of Commerce. I'm also the co-chair for the Entertainment Union Coalition, so I'm busy. Um, one of the things that people, yes, we've heard every sob story tonight and every plight that we can possibly imagine. But there's also one thing that people aren't saying, and I will say it. With the lack of loss of jobs, especially in the union situation, we are also losing people with their health care benefits. Not only that, but they've lost their homes. They've lost, they've moved into small apartments. They've moved, they've moved in together. I've got people who have been living in their cars. I've also had two members in the last year who have committed suicide, and it is directly involved with the despondency of not having jobs. We're artists, and we have a different way of thinking of things. Um, it's hit our people so, so seriously 
that every day we as business representatives, I'm also the president of the union, what we do on the phone all day is counsel people and, and try to get, encourage them to think that the jobs are going to come back and we do need your help. I hope we will all work together. Um, on the chamber I also hear the stories of how sound stages are empty. And those are tax dollars that are helping to fund this city. Um, the property taxes have been less and less in the last few years. It's in a direct correlation to the last lack of jobs here. So we encourage you to please stay with us. We'll support you, you support us. And thank you for doing this ad hoc committee. It means a lot. Thank you very much. Thank you. Appreciate your being here. Uh, our next speaker is Edward Nino. Followed by Monica Haynes Nino. Good evening. Good evening. Um, Edward Nino. Um, Sorry. Member Nino. of Local 705. Um, I'm one of these people you're talking about. Um, in the last six months, I've worked 31 days. Pretty hard to survive that way. Um, I used to make a pretty decent salary. Um, the work was here, probably making sixty-five to ninety thousand a year. It's pretty decent. Um, now I'm lucky to be making twenty-five, and um, kind of hard to pay your bills that way. Managing to survive. My wife's in the business too. She's working more, which is great, but we hardly see each other. That's a double-edged sword. Um, Jobs that um, I used to be able to be uh, chosen for to leave, which don't always want to leave, but you go where the work is, they don't even ask anymore. And if you bring it up, they're like, oh no, we're already hiring locals. I've been on a few of those jobs, hired people, all they want is the paycheck. They're not artists, they're not creative. Nothing personal. But most of us have worked pretty hard at our craft and take a lot of pride in it. So it's pretty hard to be told you can't go to do the job that you know that you're one of the better people at doing because it's all about the money. So we really do need your help. We're desperate out there. And um, it's only going to be a matter of time before the tourists stop coming here because there won't be a Hollywood to go to. Because that Hollywood's going to be in New York, Atlanta, Portland, Shreveport, Miami, Austin. So that's all I got to say. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, our next speaker is Monica Haynes Nino, followed by Cassandra Barreri. Good evening, Speaker Kikorian, um, Council Members of Farrell Price. I'm a second generation Angelino. I'm a member of Local 705 Customers. And I personally want to thank you, uh, Mr. Kikorian, for bringing the incentive to Los Angeles. A direct result of that is that my husband and I were able to work on the um, television series Justified, the first season. We were one of the shows that was picked up by the incentive. Um, that was my husband who just spoke. And while I myself have been very fortunate to have a 25-year career in this business, starting in 2008, I saw that career start to dwindle. Um, I would say that I went from working 10 months out of the year in motion pictures to working two-thirds of the year, partly on motion pictures and then on television, to working a third of the year, mostly in television, um, if I was fortunate to work on a motion picture, it was something like HBO's Behind the Candelabra, which was shot in town, but was television. Um, the rates on those are not comparable to the rates on motion pictures. And while I'm not complaining, um, I have seen many people in my industry go from working on these jobs to having to follow the circus and live in a trailer in Shreveport or New Orleans. Um, a friend of mine called me one day in tears saying she had $11,000 in the bank and they were going to take her home away from her. 
because she hadn't worked in so long. Um, I've had other people call me in tears and say that they were going to quit this business. These are people who are extremely talented, people who've been in it a long time, um, who had no other choice. They couldn't afford to move to Atlanta. They couldn't afford to move to New Mexico. They were going to leave the business and do something else. Um, I recently fielded a call from a young woman who found me on IMDb who asked advice on becoming a customer in this business and where she should go. She was offered a job in Atlanta and she also wanted to work here in Los Angeles. And I told her straight out, move to Atlanta because there's no work here. There's over 2,000 members in our local and at any given time, maybe a third of those members are working despite what our union leaders tell us. Because we talk to those people on a daily basis. We talk to those people throughout the year and we personally know what these people are going through. And when my husband says that he only worked 31 days, he only worked 31 days. We've seen our health insurance throughout the industry go down. We've seen the amount of hours that we've had to work get raised through the contracts that we were forced to sign because there were no other choices. And many of those people have been without health insurance who are begging for a day check so that they could be able to work and get their health insurance. Anyway, that's pretty much what I have to say. I really appreciate what you're doing. I really hope it works. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Thank you. Uh, our next speaker is Cassandra Barreri, followed by Sharon Craig. Good evening. Good evening. Cassandra Barrer. Um, I'm speaking to you as a native Los Angelian, born in the Hollywood Hills, uh, second generation film family. We have 30 members in the IA. My husband and I have been in the IA since 1974. So we have seen quite a few changes. Um, I will say that um, many times in our conversations we would say we live in Hollywood, we make films. If we were in Detroit, we'd be making cars. But we can see that that's a bit of a foreshadowing of what's been happening here in Hollywood to us. Um, I do believe that uh, the trickle-down theory, which many of us uh, feel is a bad thing uh, in the past, is, is currently what's affecting the people below us, if you will. Um, I'm uh, buying hamburger, not steak. I'm washing my own laundry instead of doing dry cleaning. Um, I do know that uh, during the good times, we were a bit of a chase-away production comp uh, town. We were a little arrogant. Times were good. And so we are way behind the eight ball here. Some of us have been calling for these, uh, these um, incentives, and uh, we complained, as did one gentleman, about the race to the bottom mentality. But we're in that race now. And so I'm hoping that you will take our thoughts, listen to our vendors, speak to other cities that are successful in these programs to see what we can cannibalize from their successes and use to our advantage. Um, we don't want to become um, a third-class Hollywood uh, mentality in terms of our film work. We have been the leaders. We are now teaching others to do our skills and we have allowed the other states to not only raise their skill set but to build their infrastructure. So I would hope that this committee would consider those and find creative ways to help us not only in Hollywood and Los Angeles, but to realize that if we're going to try and fly this on a state level, we have to show each locale what the benefit is. We have to show Modesto why they want this. We have to show San Francisco why they want this. And not, not ask for money that all of us, I'm a community activist and I work very hard through Councilman Labonge's office and before that Councilman Koretz's office. We need to understand that other people in other areas have to be advised on how it affects their lives. So I will follow the committee, I will attend your meetings, and I will uh, offer any support and help that I can. Thank you very much for holding these. Thank you very much. I appreciate those comments. And on the point of cannibalizing what other cities are doing, uh, folks, other cities may not be as forthcoming as I would like in sharing with us how we can compete better with them. So, um, but you all work in those cities. And so if you can give us, you know, what you've learned from other cities about how we do, co how they do cost reduction, how some people, a few people were mentioning the cost of the police, cost of fire department, cost of street closures, uh, that film California first, some of those strategies. Please, those are the sorts of things that I hope that you'll share with us um, 
uh, either during the course of these hearings or, or by emailing your suggestions to us. Uh, our next speaker is Sharon Craig, followed by Pamela Miller. Ms. Craig, good evening. Good evening. Sharon Craig, I am a production accountant and I represent Local 871. And just to follow up on what you just said, I'm probably one of those people who can give you a lot of information about how the other states operate, how aggressive they are, what their tax credits entail. Um, I have been working out of state from 2007 to 2013. Out of the 17 films or film projects, some of them were MOW, some of them were pilots, um, some of them were small, low-budget, independent films, some of them were studio films. Out of those 17 films, 14 of them were out of state. I've worked in Utah. I've worked in Atlanta multiple times, at least eight times. I've worked in Chicago, Boston on two occasions, Detroit on three occasions. I actually spent 10 months at a time in Detroit and had nothing to do but spend my money on cold weather clothes that I didn't need when I came back to Los Angeles. Um, and I can tell you, from a personal perspective, people think it's fun to travel and to be out of town so much. It's not. It really isn't. You live out of a suitcase. You're away from your family. You're away from your friends. You're lucky if you have, a, if you have access to a rental car because you don't always get a rental car when you're out of state. And you have nothing to do. You're not familiar with the state. Um, you're, sometimes you're not familiar with the city. Of course, I'm very familiar with Atlanta. I've spent so much time there. Um, but it's, it's not fun. Um, and I know a lot of people tonight have talked about not having jobs here. I'm fortunate in that in my class, in the position that I work in, I'm, I'm basically employed all the time as a production accountant. But it's out of town. And I like to stay in town. I like to have a better quality of life. I like to be in town and be involved in my community and be with my husband a little more. You know, when I first started traveling, I was a, I was a newlywed. And um, it was, it's very difficult. He's here and I'm out of town all the time. But people say that Atlanta is the new Hollywood of the South, but the magic actually happens here in Los Angeles. So let's try to keep the magic here in California. Here, here. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Pamela Miller, followed by Robert DeStefan. Hi. Hi, good evening. Um, I'm Pamela Miller. I work with uh, Film Independent. I have a slightly different perspective. We're a uh, media arts nonprofit organization. Uh -huh. Um, we have, we're a membership organization. We have about um, 4,500 members. All, um, most of them are based in Los Angeles. Um, most, many of them are independent filmmakers. Um, we produce the Independent Spirit Awards. It's coming up this weekend. The LA Film Festival in downtown each June. And um, we have an artist development programming and educational programming that supports our um, independent filmmaker constituencies. Um, I just want to make a few points. One is that, um, you know, we're aware there's a lot of political opposition to the state incentives because the conversation is being framed around providing windfalls to fat cats at major studios and and um, you know about the you know there's been a lot of talk here about the importance of mega budget pictures um, and we you know film independent would like to help shift the conversation to focus on those small budget filmmakers um, one to two million dollars um, you know we have if it, it doesn't um, you know when we have hundreds of filmmakers making one to two million dollar budget pictures it, it does have a major um, economic impact on the city um, one thing uh, you know we've been doing in the past year, uh, our executive staff and our board members have made it a priority to focus on this issue. Um, we are committing resources to creating a grant and incentive program for our filmmakers to keep their productions in LA. We're working on creating a, a cross-sector coalition of partners. Um, we have talked to Film LA, um, you know, vendors, uh, post-production houses, people who, who share our interests, so that we can um, come up with some um, incentive packages that will be of value to the, the smaller budget filmmakers. Uh, you know, we're looking for um, uh, some local city government partners in that in that effort as well. Um, 
The last thing I'll say is that uh, the uh, 20th anniversary of the Los Angeles Film Festival is coming up this summer. Um, our festival director, Stephanie Elaine, and, and our film curator, Elvis Mitchell, are putting together a showcase of work that's going to celebrate the history of Los Angeles as, um, as a creative capital and as a filmmaking capital of the world. And um, we would welcome the opportunity to use that festival as a platform to um, promote the mayor's efforts to... Um, you know, help get the word out. I went to a meeting where he talked about, you know, the tagline, LA is where creativity lives, and we certainly have a very visible public platform to, um, to help uh, get that word out. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much. Uh, and, and again, just to reiterate, uh, there's, uh, as I see it, two big sets of issues here. One is the statewide film incentive, film and television production tax incentive, which we'll be talking about primarily at the next meeting. An entirely separate set of issues, entirely separate from that, are the sorts of cost drivers that affect independent filmmakers disproportionately. And those are some of the local costs, the permitting costs, and uh, that, the aggravations of dealing with the city bureaucracy, availability of locations, all of those sorts of issues, which we'll be talking about in our third meeting. But those are exactly the things that we're looking forward to hearing from all of you. Um, all right, our next speaker is Robert DeStefan, followed by Brad Look. Robert left, and is Brad Look uh, still here? He'll be followed by uh, Veronique Val. She left. She left. Okay. Brad? Hi. Hi. Mr. Luck, uh, how are you? I'm doing fine. I just wanted to let you know that I work as a, a union makeup artist. Last year I was out of, the, out of the state five different times. And what's happening is going to these different locations, I'm starting to see some of the different local people start to look at us as if we are the outsiders coming to their territory and they're being threatened by us. I've had some extras tell me that in so many words. And when we go to some of these locations, we're being asked to train some of the locals there, which in turn means that they don't need us again. And when I was in Georgia, they were showing me photographs of what they're doing now with Pinewood Studios moving there. So they're encroaching in all different areas of what we do here, and some of the people in some of those different locations I've worked at have voiced the opinion that they'd like to see us go under. And if we continue at the rate we're going, we will. That's all I wanted to say. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, our next speaker is David Hales, followed by Adriana de la Cruz. Good evening, sir. Good evening, Council. My name is David Hales, and I am a third-generation Angelino and civil service representative. I was forced to take an early retirement from an injury due to the danger in which I provide rescue services for many industries. I have provided service first as a licensed general contractor, a commercial oil and gas dive medic, a Goodhue ambulance driver during the Los Angeles riots, and then as an Inglewood fireman in which I was finally injured. I have never complained how, about how hard my job was until now. All I ask is to be able to work and provide well for my family. Now that has been threatened by the slowly diminishing work over the past 10 years in which our current industry in motion picture I have found a union home with for the past 18 years. I have three intelligent progeny to take care of. My son wanting a college education, I could not provide for him due to the lack of work in this industry, had to go fight in wars around the world in these special forces of our United States Army and barely made it back with three Purple Hearts and much grief from his service abroad. If I could have worked more than part-time and made enough to pay for his college, I wouldn't have to have to, I would not have had to have my son shot, stabbed, and blown up. And these, how is this connected to the IA, Local 767, in which had to close its membership last year after 17 years of my service? The first, the first aid union had to join the local 80 grips to survive this recession. If I could have made a regular full-time salary as a set medic over 18 years, 
I would have been able to pay for my, all of my children's college education. Instead of having my motion picture health and welfare pension insurance plans intermittently canceled due to the decrease of work and the increase of qualifying hours maintained by our family's medical insurance. All around the same time as the affordable health care was being rolled out of our nation, our insurance made our unions increase the, qualifying, increase the qualifying hours from 400 hours of service instead of the usual 300 hours of service in which my qualifying period for the past 17 years have been sanctioned. So most are struggling to stay in the industry in which I have loved to work since this Great Recession began. This industry has provided vendors with money necessary to stay in business in California throughout this recessive years. We buy everything from bullets to band-aids and everything in between. Now the state is broke, mainly due to the amount of work of our industry leaving the state. Why would they leave Hollywood, you may ask? Due to the incentives given by other states. New York's $410 million in tax breaks, incentives to stay home and film. How will we compete in California? How will we pay for our children's needs? Currently, I have daughters in college. How will I survive this motion picture industry as a lifeguard, dive master, professional independent stuntman for the next 18 years? How many occupations must we do to survive this industry's recession by this great state offering the same incentives that other states do? That's how. 500, 000, sorry, 500 million at least to entice them back here. Get rid of the lottery program and listen to these people who are suffering with me. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. <clears throat> and our final speaker is Adriana De La Cruz. Good evening, welcome. Thank you, gentlemen, Mr. Price. Gentlemen. Um, I appreciate you taking the time to be here uh, and listening to our concerns. Uh, one of the things that I have uh, wanted to speak about was uh, my personal uh, insight. However, I realized that what you really uh, haven't heard predominantly was how, how well the industry itself does contribute to the city. I am a set medic. Uh, been so thankfully for the since 2005 prior to that I was a city employee in addition to working for a hospital uh, which is also in the city Los Angeles um, I want to emphasize that uh, the money that the television motion picture studios do contribute does help you know the city economy the workers behind me uh, we all suffer in one way or another some more than others we do leave the state to be able to maintain the, the basic quality of life that, you know, any parent, daughter, son needs to provide for their family. <clears throat> One of the things I want to point out specifically is that, you know, these dollars do get spent in the city, but they also help the ancillary services that I'm most concerned about. The police officers who do uh, cordon off the streets when we do film in the streets, you know, those are city employees, uh, in addition to the firefighters and the paramedics, ambulances that are there to stand by to be able to provide uh, services when we're doing stunts. Uh, in addition to that, you know, uh, myself uh, being an EMT, there's nurses, there's uh, LVNs, there's paramedics. We all left um, the this, this city because there's cutbacks as well. There usually are at every given time based on the budget. And we had uh, the opportunity to be in the film industry. You know, and that really helps a lot because it keeps us afloat. It keeps us from being, uh, you know, get it, getting the unemployment. You know, it, it keeps us uh, spending the money that we work really hard to in Los Angeles. So please, you know, thank you for taking the time. There's a lot of work that needs to be done. I appreciate it. And it's, as you can tell, it's very emotional. I, I understand the opposition saying that there's a lot of tax breaks, but let's try to make, make a change. Thank you. Thank you very much. Ma
Well, thank you all again very, very much. I appreciate your coming out. I appreciate your patience in staying uh, to this late hour. Um, I think it should be obvious to anybody who's watched this uh, of the, um, the tremendous human impact that the loss of production in Los Angeles has had. And uh, while it's been moving and in some ways um, discouraging and sad to hear uh, the stories of these seasoned professionals who are not getting work now and, and hearing about the family impacts that uh, runaway production has had. Uh, at the same time, what I've heard tonight is a significant amount of commitment as well uh, to keeping Hollywood here where it belongs. And it's been inspiring for me to hear those of you who um, have been hurting, who are still in the fight, is still willing to, to stand up and, and make sure that we keep our heritage industry here at home where it belongs. Uh, so I want to thank you all very much for being here. Uh, colleagues, any closing comments? Mr. Price? No, I just uh, too want to thank those who uh, have been in attendance, those of you who testified. Uh, certainly uh, you helped to bring home the importance uh, of the hearing and the industry. You know, it's not this multi-billion dollar industry, it's about people, it's about lives, about communities, about families. And um, we certainly want to, uh, Mr. I look forward to our follow-up hearing. Do we have a date set for that yet? I was just about to text my staff and ask that <laughs> very question, actually. We do not currently have uh, okay. our next date set, um, but uh, stay tuned. We will certainly let all of the uh, uh, representatives who were here from the business community and from labor know that who will in turn pass it on um, and you can also anybody who's interested in emailing any of us please do you can reach me at councilmember.krikorian.lacity.org um, if you write to me with your ideas we'll be sure to let you know as well when our next uh, next year well, Mr. Chairman I look forward to that meeting look forward to uh, the follow-on comments of, uh, of those affected and appreciate your leadership. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Price. Mr. O'Farrell. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I, I want to stand with you tonight and thank all of you for your heartfelt, very well-informed, experienced testimony, and thank all of you for devoting your professional lives to making people happy across the world with the entertainment industry that you so um, deeply believe in, uh, and I stand with all of you on doing everything we can to figure this out. It's a crisis, clearly, and we, we need to do better, and we, we will. And I'm just, I'm encouraged at the same time, uh, it, it has been very tough to hear, but I'm encouraged. I'm encouraged that we are all committed to, to bringing this industry back and making it stronger than ever before. And I also want to echo uh, Mr. Krikorian's comments on and, and really give a shout out to Council President Herb Wesson. Uh, an ad hoc committee on, on the entertainment industry has never been done before. This is the first time the City of Los Angeles has formalized a process to explore what we can do to keep the industry here in Los Angeles and keep it stronger and make it stronger than ever before. So uh, this is an initial first step. I think it's been a great first meeting. And again, thank you all for being here tonight and for staying till the bitter end. Thank you so much. Thank you all very much. Appreciate your being down. And with that, for the moment, we are adjourned.